the, you know, you and Fiona will turn back your cameras. Um, and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, start it now, okay? Okay, you turned it on. So I, I think I did. Yeah, the people are starting to to roll in. 40, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just wait until it's kind of leveled off, I think. Okay, I think I'll start now. We, we seem to have kind of a leveling off of participants. Um, of course, people may still join us, but welcome to the first Health Law Seminar of 2021. The Health Law Seminar Series is brought to you, brought to us, by the Health Law Institute at Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. And during our seminar series, we have closed captioning available if you would like that option while you are viewing the uh, participating in the seminar. There should be a little icon at the bottom right of your screen to invite you to turn on closed captioning. I will let you know that this, uh, this uh, seminar will be recorded and publicly available on YouTube, um, of course, no one besides the, the speakers are shown. Um, it doesn't capture the audience in that way. After the talk, we will have a question and answer period. And you can enter your questions through the chat function throughout uh, Dr. Kumagin's talk. And then you can also use the vote function to if your question is very similar to someone else's question and you wanna bump that question up, you can do that. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Fiona Kiyumjin, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University, and also an adjunct scientist at ICES. Fiona is a family physician, a public health physician, and an epidemiologist. She has worked as a family physician in a jail in Ontario since 2007 and she conducts research focused on the health of people who experience imprisonment. Thank you so much, Fiona, for uh, joining us, participating in this, and I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Martha, and um, with, with apologies for doing this. Martha, I don't think you introduced who you are. Do you wanna take a minute to introduce yourself? <laughs> I think you're still on mute. Um, I'm Martha Painter. I am a registered nurse and a uh, doctoral candidate in the School of Nursing at Dalhousie University. I'm a research scholar with the Health Law Institute, and I am delighted to be hosting uh, Dr. Kimjin today because my research also intersects um, with health and criminalization and um, Dr. Kumjin's work is really critical in this field in, in Canada. She is the leading voice. So thank you so much. Thanks, Martha. I just thought it would be good for people to know who you are also as um, a great point of contact locally. And so thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak today. And thanks to Martha for the introduction and to Adelina for inviting me and also to Marnie for providing the um, closed captioning. I'm just gonna share my screen. Excellent. I wanted to start by saying that I have a lot of um, great um, memories of, um, or great associations, I should say, with the law school at Dalhousie because um, I, I went to medical school at Dalhousie and spent a lot of time studying in the law school library, which at that time was considered the best place to study. So um, yeah, I have lots of good memories and, and possibly um, several uh, memories of, of uh, uh, being very anxious also. But um, yeah, a pleasure to, to speak with you today. 
So I have two objectives for this talk. The first is to describe the health status of people who experience imprisonment in Canada. And the second is to consider opportunities to improve health for this population. And, and just to let you know, as we start, um, when I use this term imprisonment, I know that in Canada, that is often the term prison is specific to people in federal facilities, but I'm using it in the sense that we use it internationally, where anyone who is uh, in detention or who is incarcerated, whether they're in a provincial or a federal facility, I include those in, the, in this broad term imprisonment. So I have four key messages that I'd like to share with you. The first is that imprisonment, again, both including detention and incarceration is common in Canada. And to start out, um, I would like to ask you a quiz question. Um, what proportion of adults spend time in jail or prison each year in Ontario? And Adelina, if you're able to um, put this up. And I, I'm presenting this for Ontario only because I don't know this information for Nova Scotia. And I, I'm certainly happy for um, anyone who does know this information to um, put it into the Q&A because um, I think the chat box is disabled. Um, yeah. Happy to hear you. Um, maybe I'll just be quiet for a minute and let you think and put in the answer. So what proportion of adults spend time each year in jail or prison in Ontario? And again, this is likely similar for Nova Scotia. Just give you a few more seconds. Okay. Adelina, I don't know if you can close the poll and we can see the results. Okay, so you can see that about 12% said one in 10,000, 42% said one in 3,000, 32% said one in 1,000, 9% said one in 300, and 5% said one in 100. Um, so I will close that. So it seems like most people think it's about one in 3,000 people who spend time in jails or prisons. So it's actually much more common than that. It's one in 300 people. And for those of you who think like this can't be right, which was my initial reaction when I looked at this, um, I've, I've looked at um, population-based data for this population in Ontario. And this is actually only people in the provincial system. So I'm not even including people in the federal system, which shows that there are about 40 to 50,000 people um, per year who spend at least one night in a jail or prison. And that's of the, um, over the time period that it's between 40 and 50,000, between 11 and 12 million adults in Ontario. So if you take that ratio, you can see that it's between, um, well, it's always less than one in 300 people. So I think this is important when we talk about the health of this population for a few reasons. One is um, spending time in prison often reflects poor health. So this is a consequence of having poor health. An, an obvious example would be um, having a substance use disorder, which in the context of the criminalization of illicit substance use can often end up um, leading to incarceration. But also, this is often a, a significant exposure for poor health outcomes, and we'll come back to that in more detail. But when we talk about um, the uh, importance of this population, a focus of, on the health of this population, I think it really matters to talk about the fact that this is a relatively common experience for people. And in particular, we know that specific subpopulations are overrepresented in people who experience incarceration, such as people who are Indigenous, people who are Black, and, and males compared to females. And the last thing is, I think when we think about indicators of our society and the, what um, criminal justice system, uh, how it impacts our population, um, often we only see data presented on the cross-sectional population. So on any given day, how many people experience imprisonment and what's the rate of incarceration per 100,000? But of course it matters not only how many people are incarcerated on any given day, but also over the course of a longer time period, how, does, how do people interact with our criminal justice system. Okay, so this is a bit more detail. So I've got data here for Ontario, Nova Scotia, and then Canada, and I've, the two columns are per day and per year. So we have um, relatively um, accessible data on the number of the cross-sectional population, as I said before. So on any given day, how many people experience incarceration? So in Ontario, for provincial correctional facilities, and these data are from the 2018-2019 Statistics Canada adult correctional statistics. So these don't reflect changes 
um, in the context of some decarceration with respect to um, the coronavirus pandemic. But, but anyway, it gives you a rough sense. So for Ontario per day, we have about 7,500 people in correctional facilities. And again, that's decreased during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but per year in our provincial correctional facilities, it's about between 40 and 50,000. Um, the data per year are not made accessible routinely through Statistics Canada, although Statistics Canada is currently um, uh, doing work through a, um, uh, one of their routine correctional surveys to collect and share this information, but that won't be done for all provinces and territories, as well as for federal uh, facilities at this time. I don't have the data on the number of people per day in Ontario in federal facilities. Um, and again, that's just not easily accessible. For Nova Scotia, the cross-sectional information for 2018-19 are that there are 468 people in correctional facilities. And I don't know if it's made uh, routinely available how many people are experiencing incarceration in provincial or federal facilities per year. Again, feel free to add that to the Q&A if you, if you have that information and also what the source is because um, it's helpful for, for us to understand what that looks like. And then for Canada, so um, again, in the adult correctional st statistics from Statistics Canada, the data on provincial facilities show that um, there are about 24,000 people in provincial and territorial facilities on any given day and about 14,000 in federal facilities on any given day. We don't know how many people across the country experience incarceration in provincial and territorial facilities. And from speaking with colleagues at the Correctional Service of Canada, there are probably about 20,000 people who experience incarceration per year in federal facilities. So here we are in Canada, we have amazing data systems. We can't say this is the number of people in our provinces, in our, ter in our territories and um, across the country that experience um, detention and incarceration per year, which to my mind is very problematic. Okay, so the second key message is that health status is worse for people who experience imprisonment compared with the general population. And, and when I talk about health status, um, absolutely that refers to the prevalence of disease, which is a more um, traditional way to look at health status, but it also um, includes a broader framing of what health means. And I like to use the um, definition from the World Health Organization, which is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely, merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this is one of my two super overwhelming slides. And um, uh, although I think there is some value to just being able to see um, everything all together, um, and being able to look at the fact that the arrows up, which indicate that health is worse, are consistently pointing up across these domains of health. Um, I also appreciate that this is a challenging slide to interpret, so I'll take you through it line by line. So this is morbidity and mortality. So morbidity being indicators of disease. There's also some information on risk factors in here. Um, and comparing with the general population. And this is research that is specific to Canada, but I think all of it is consistent across um, jurisdictions internationally um, with some gaps in available data for sure. So starting on the first line, so if we look at, oops, sorry, all cause mortality. So obviously morbidity isn't relevant here, but when we compare people who experience imprisonment to others who are matched by age and sex, we can see that within um, a given period, so this is a population-based study that, that I led um, using data from Ontario, all people admitted to provincial correctional facilities, we followed them for 12 years. Um, and we found that they were four times more likely to die within that time period compared to people in the general population with the same age and sex. The second line is infectious diseases. So we know that um, there is substantial overrepresentation of people with HIV and hepatitis C, and that's due to a variety of um, reasons, including the um, criminalization of illicit substance use, as well as the lack of access to harm reduction tools, both in the community and in prisons. And that leads to increased morbidity for HIV. Um, the rates of uh, the prevalence of HIV is five to 25 times higher in people in prisons compared to in the general population. And the, the prevalence of hepatitis C is extremely high in this population with most recent Canadian estimates showing about 20% of people in our um, correctional facilities have hepatitis C infection. Um, and also uh, increased mortality associated with both these conditions. Moving to the third line, um, cancer. So we don't have a lot of evidence on this, but we, we have um, strong evidence that shows that um, 
incidence of lung cancer, liver cancer, cervical cancer, and head and neck um, are increased, and also that there's increased mortality associated with, with those four types of cancer. And um, just to think a little bit more specifically about why that might be, we know there's overrepresentation in this population of smoking, which um, is the strongest risk factor for lung cancer, um, with uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which contribute to liver cancer, and of HPV, human papillomavirus, which um, are the strongest risk factors for cervical cancer, as well as for head and neck cancer. Going down to the fourth line, so mental illness and substance use disorders, I think many of you will be familiar with this. We have substantial overrepresentation of people with um, various types of mental illness, including uh, mood disorders like depression and bipolar disease, anxiety disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder, um, psychotic illness such as schizophrenia, um, and personality disorders, as well as substance use disorders. Um, and those are associated with substantial morbidity and substantial mortality. The next line is chronic diseases. So again, evidence of increased um, prevalence of diabetes and respiratory diseases, likely for the respiratory diseases also associated with smoking and of injury. So injury um, includes unintentional, intentional, sorry, intentional and unintentional injuries. So intentional injuries would include injuries from assault. Um, sorry, intentional injuries would include things like self-harm and suicide and unintentional injuries would include things like overdose and um, experiencing assault. Um, the, the second to last row here, reproductive health. So we've done some population health research that shows um, substantially increased um, adverse um, outcomes during pregnancy. And this is things like in infants having um, uh, increased birth prematurely, increased preterm birth, as well as being born small for the um, gestational age. So the stage of development of the infant. Um, and also in um, increased rates of having to go to the ICU um, as a neonate, and then for women having increased rates of um, placental abruption where the placenta prematurely separates from the uterus, which of course has um, substantial risks for the infant. And the final line, so again, with this broad um, definition of health, we think about determinants of health. So increased adverse childhood experiences such as experiencing violence um, and other forms of abuse and also witnessing domestic violence, lower rates of, um, sorry, lower average levels of educational attainment, um, lower rates of employment and lower uh, income in people who experience incarceration compared to the general population. Now I should say, of course, that this is a very heterogeneous population. So all of these data I'm presenting represent a whole population perspective. So when we look at the whole population of people who experience imprisonment and compare it with the whole population of people who, um, or others in the population, these are the trends we tend to see. Why is health worse in this population? So a few um, mechanisms. The first is that poor health can lead to imprisonment. So I've already mentioned criminalization of drug use, which can lead to people who use drugs, including people with substance use disorders being arrested and incarcerated, and also criminalization of mental illness. So um, people with um, poorly treated mental illness, including psychotic illness, uh, might be more likely to um, experience incarceration. The second um, general mechanism is that imprisonment itself can exacerbate health. And we see many people who experience imprisonment um, being imprisoned many times. People often will call our jails revolving doors. Um, and, and that can be direct, um, directly that imprisonment exacerbates health. So for example, people who go into um, correctional facilities tend to have an exacerbation of their mental health, and that's both sort of positive mental health and also an exacerbation of uh, mental illness. And people will often also experience um, harms from substance use, um, including um, uh, overdose uh, or um, risk of infection from using, and that can be superficial infections like cellulitis as well as um, bloodborne infections like HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, because of the lack of access to um, needle syringe exchange programs and other harm reduction um, opportunities. 
Um, and imprisonment, of course, also impacts the factors that contribute to um, health. And that, as you can imagine, being incarcerated for a period of days, weeks, months, years would impact your employment status. And that's both if you have a job, um, your ability to maintain that job, as well as your risk of or your ability to access a job once you have um, been incarcerated. Um, your housing status, of course, people um, aren't being paid well, many people aren't being paid while they're incarcerated um, and so have real challenges with maintaining their housing status in the community while they're incarcerated and um, and then relationships so um, the impact on um, people's children people's partners people's friends neighbors communities are substantial when someone goes into um, a correctional facility and there are undoubtedly other mechanisms also but but those are just two that I think are particularly important when we think about the health status of this population so how does the health of this population um, impact the general population? And again, I've met, mentioned a couple of these already, disturbed social roles, as I just was describing, transmission of communicable diseases. So if people are having unprotected sexual contacts while they're incarcerated, um, whether consensual or non-consensual, if people are um, sharing needles as, as examples, um, in correctional facilities, of course, when they are um, released back to the community, they continue to carry those infections with them and then might be putting other people at, at risk of those infections also. Um, in terms of public safety, so if we have people who are not um, accessing adequate treatment for mental illness, there are risks in terms of um, violent behaviors that can result from that. And then, of course, there are substantial costs to our healthcare and criminal justice system for people um, having poor health. Um, again, it leading to um, incarceration, which is costly. And then, in terms of healthcare, um, untreated healthcare or not treating health issues early on. Um, and ideally preventing health conditions from happening in the first place um, is less expensive than treating um, health conditions after they've um, arisen or um, after they have um, developed into more severe illness. And this is a picture um, of a mural that I like to use because I think that um, while many of us are interested in addressing the health of people who experience imprisonment um, because it's important in and of itself, um, I think there are benefits, um, many benefits to, for our whole population in terms of um, addressing and redressing health issues in this population. So closing the gap is good for Canada's health. And it's a mural from um, the old Wellesley Hospital in Toronto. Okay, key message number three, healthcare access and quality are worse for people who experience imprisonment compared with the general population. And this is true both while people who are in custody and in the community. And I've just chosen a few um, research or examples of research um, that I think illustrate this and, and might be of interest to you. So some of you will be familiar with this um, type of study, which is an audit study, um, which is frequently used in employment studies. So people will um, either go for a job interview and have people, for example, people who have um, from different uh, racial groups um, or um, send in CVs with names that suggest different ethnicities and see how that impacts their ability to access a job. So in this study, um, which was led by colleagues in BC, um, our group was looking at access to primary care based on whether someone um, reported that they'd been recently released from prison or not. So within our research team, um, some of the researchers called families physicians offices, and this is based on offices that were listed on the BC I might not get the language exactly right, but the BC Medical Society has a list of people who are open to new patients. So called those offices and asked for an appointment. And in the end, they ended up contacting 250 offices. And the caller either said, I'm a person who's been recently released from prison and I'm looking for a family physician, or I'm a person who's looking for a family physician. And the outcome was whether that person was offered an appointment. So the people you can see at the bar graph at the bottom, the people who were for the people who were said that they'd been recently released, 43% were offered an appointment. And that contrasts with 84% in 
who said, I'm looking for a family position without saying that they had a history of recent release from prison. 84% um, said that, um, sorry, in 84% of those calls, people were offered an appointment. So this is just one indicator of the experiences that people may um, encounter in the healthcare system. And of course, this is an artificial setup, but I think nonetheless um, speaks to the fact that people who experience imprisonment um, experience discrimination within our healthcare system. So this second slide is um, uh, looking at PAP testing for people in Ontario and looking at people who were um, experienced imprisonment in our provincial correctional facilities and those who did not. And um, I think um, arguably PAP testing might not be the number one priority for healthcare for people who experience incarceration, but it is a fairly standard indicator of quality of care for um, females. Um, that, that we often use in primary care. So I think it's important because it speaks to whether people are accessing um, preventive care. So if you look at the bar graph, um, this shows that, um, well, I'll, the darker bar is for people who are in the so-called prison group. So people who experienced incarceration and the lighter bar is for people in the general population, the rest of the general population, I should say. So if you look at the bars on the left, um, the y-axis here is whether people are up to date for screening. So at the moment of, at the time of admission to jail for the prison group for the general population, it's just at the analogous time, 46% were up to date. So for most people that would be having had a PAP test within the previous three years. Um, and that contrasts with people, the people in the rest of the general population for whom 67% were up to date with respect to their PAP testing. So um, much lower rates of PAP testing in the previous three years for people who experience incarceration compared to people in the general population. We then followed the same group of people over the next three years, and we could see that three years later, 64% of people in the prison group were up to date um, with respect to their screening. Um, and, and sorry, let, let me uh, elaborate that a little more. So, that's just following the people who, um, uh, who were not up to date. Three years later, 64% of them were still, um, sorry, I'm getting myself in a muddle. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'll, I'll start again. So at the time of jail admission, you can see that the rates of being up to date are much lower for people who are in the prison group compared to the general population. And that's still the case three years later. And, and I think this is important because um, many of us uh, who work in, in um, correctional facilities are interested in what are the opportunities if people have to go to correctional facilities, how can we use this as an opportunity to support people in meeting their health needs. So this to me shows that um, although over time people do access preventive care, there's still a gap where some people who are experiencing incarceration, um, who might have been able to access this preventive care while in custody, still are not accessing this preventive care. And, and this can be for various reasons. People might be, it's possible that people are being offered care and they're refusing it. But nonetheless, I think there is an, an unmet need here for preventive care. And I think we need to be creative when we think about how can we help people meet their preventive care needs and how can we make it um, possible for people to um, uh, access care in a way that's acceptable to them. This is my second overwhelming slide. So again, with apologies, and I'll speak through this in some detail. Okay, so this is looking broadly at use of healthcare. And this is following about 50,000 people who were released from Ontario Provincial Correctional Facilities in 2010. Okay, so I'm gonna talk you through each of these graphs and I'll just ask you to ignore the numbers for now. So the first graph is ambulatory care. So this is outpatient care. So going to see a family physician would be an example of that, but it could also be going to see a psychiatrist or a cardiologist or other um, people in other specialties. So when we look at the um, gray bar, the first gray bar, so um, in prison, um, you can see that um, uh, comparing the time in prison to, and this is following the same people over time, looking at the time in prison and then following people at the first week after they're released. 
and then the next three weeks, and then a longer, the next few months after that, you can see that people are using more ambulatory care while they're in prison compared to in the community. And we don't know why this is. Um, it's possible that people are using sort of following from the, um, what I was describing before, that people um, are using the time in prison to have their needs met. And that would be, I think, great and appropriate use of healthcare in prison. But of concern, um, if this drops at the time of release, when many people likely would need to access primary care, for example, to um, access prescriptions um, or to um, access various services and, and care needs, given that this is a stressful time, um, the concern is, are there barriers to people accessing primary care and other kinds of outpatient care at the time of release? And to follow from that, if we look at the data for emergency department use, we can see that um, comparing in prison to the week after release, the rates of emergency department use go up substantially. So to me, this suggests a problem in terms of continuity of care. What are the services? Um, what are the health issues that aren't being addressed, which lead to people needing to use the emergency department? Um, so to me, this is flagging um, a, a concerning issue, which is that people aren't getting their needs met at the time of release. And that's similarly reflected when we look at hospitalization in the bottom two graphs. On the left, we have hospitalization for medical or surgical reasons, and then hospitalization for psychiatric reasons. So again, ignoring the numbers, but just looking at the patterns, we can see that from the time when people are in prison to the week after release, you can see a substantial increase in terms of rates of hospitalization. And to a large extent, this is due to things like injury, including unintentional injury like overdose. And then if we shift over to psychiatric hospitalization, we also see a substantial increase. And, and the psychiatric hospitalization in particular is concerning to me because, um, it's unlikely that within the first few days of release that people would decompensate so severely. It's, it's quite difficult to get admitted to hospital for psychiatric reasons. Um, in terms, when I, when I say that, what I mean is you have to be very sick to be admitted to hospital for psychiatric reasons. So to me, this spike is very concerning and it could signal both that people are worsening substantially in terms of their um, psychiatric health. It might also indicate that we are um, not providing access to hospitalization for people while they're incarcerated. Um, and I'll say that in a different way. Um, often as a family physician, I see people in um, a correctional facility who are very ill from a psychiatric perspective. And I think there's often a, a perception that people are accessing the care they need because they're in custody and they're not um, at risk of harming themselves or other, others because they're in custody. But um, certainly incarceration does not provide the care and services that hospitalization provides for psychiatric reasons. So again, this pattern of a, a, um, a significant um, increase in hospitalization at the time of release is concerning. And then just to show you broadly, so the numbers here represent when we compare people who were released from provincial correctional facilities with people in the general population, this is the number of times higher. So for for this one, for ambulatory care, while people were in prison, they were 5.3 times as likely to use, um, or they had rates of use of um, ambulatory care that were 5.3 times higher than age and sex match people in the general population. So you can see across all of these um, types of care, people who experience incarceration are, are have much higher rates of use compared to people in the general population. And I'll just flag in particular for psychiatric hospitalization, um, while in prison, people are about 22 times as likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. And then in the week after release, 58 times as likely as people who are age and sex matched in the general population to be hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. So to me, this really speaks to the high amount of psychiatric morbidity and the severity of disease in this population. Okay, so the fourth key message 
is that there are opportunities to improve health for people who experience imprisonment. And I think this is really important for all of us who um, are concerned about the health of this population, um, that we recognize that there are opportunities for each of us, whether as physicians, um, other healthcare providers, lawyers, or citizens to contribute to improving health for, for this population. So I've sort of broadly sketched out um, opportunities to improve health, there are many upstream strategies and that's not gonna be what I'm focusing on. But when I talk about upstream strategies, um, basic um, things about people's life experiences that contribute directly or indirectly to them ending up in correctional facilities. And that can be things like healthy childhoods. Um, so not experiencing um, abuse in childhood. Um, that can be some of our social policies. What are our housing opportunities, employment opportunities, um, income opportunities that can sort of contribute to people having a healthier life and in turn um, not be not sort of following a trajectory that would lead to them experiencing incarceration or imprisonment. And then there are downstream strategies. So specific um, uh, so I sort of grouped this into three areas, which are my focus. The first is preventing imprisonment. The second is improving healthcare in jails and prisons. And the third is supporting health on release. So when we think about um, preventing imprisonment, so this can be how do we make sure that people have access to high quality healthcare in the community. So treatment for substance use disorders, treatment for mental illness, which is accessible and acceptable. Um, how do we dismantle the um, barriers to access um, and improve care so that um, people will um, access the care that they need to prevent imprisonment? Obviously, there are many legal um, opportunities also. So, you know, how can we improve access to drug courts being one example? Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Obviously, um, there are people in this call who have much more expertise in this than I do. The second area is improving healthcare in jails and prisons. So as I said before, if people um, must experience imprisonment in terms of that's our um, legal um, and policy context, what can we do to support people meeting their needs um, while they're in jails and prisons? And given that I'm a physician, my focus is on health. Um, one of the areas that I think is important is improving healthcare while people are in jail and in prison. And the third is how do we support health on release? So um, the period of release to the community is associated with a lot of health risks, including, um, as I showed you in some of the date data, um, high risks of emergency department use. We also see high, high risk of um, mortality from overdose at the time of release. Um, and then more broadly, obviously, challenges in terms of reintegrating into families and communities, accessing housing, um, accessing employment and income supports. How do we make sure that we have um, continuity of care and uh, discharge planning and accessible um, community-based structures so that people are able to um, achieve uh, health on release? I just wanted to go into a bit more detail on the second, which is improving healthcare in jails and prisons. I think it's important to um, conceptualize. I'll switch to the next slide. What are we aiming for when we think about healthcare in prisons? And, and again, I think ideally we, we keep people out of prisons when possible. If people have to go into health into prisons, what should healthcare look like? So. Um, I've put four um, possible ways to think about this here and I'll go into a bit more detail on each of them. So we have international standards. Um, we could define standards based on federal and provincial or territorial legislation. Um, we can think about providing care that's equivalent to the care that's provided in the community. And then we can think about providing care that's equitable to the care provided in the community. So in terms of international standards, so um, the uh, Nelson Mandela rules, also called the United Nations Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners, which are internationally agreed upon standards. Again, this is for the minimum um, rule. So this isn't supposed to be aspirational. This is supposed to be like at least countries should be doing this. So I just picked out a few of those um, uh, rules uh, 
to illustrate um, some of the challenges that we have. So the first is healthcare services should be organized in close relationship to the general public health administration and in a way that ensures continuity of treatment and care, including for HIV, tuberculosis and other infectious diseases, as well as for drug dependence. Um, I think that um, we don't do this um, consistently well across uh, jurisdictions in Canada um, and and certainly the close relationship I think is, is inconsistent. Um, so this, um, again, international standards, I think that there are um, major challenges to this within uh, many jurisdictions in Canada. Looking at rule 25, um, so uh, it says every prison shall have in place a healthcare service tasked with evaluating, promoting, protecting and improving the physical and mental health of prisoners, paying particular attention to prisoners with special healthcare needs or with health issues that hamper their rehabilitation. Um, every jurisdiction in Canada, of course, has healthcare services within um, correctional facilities, but I think that it's exceptional to have in place routine evaluation of those services, to have in place strong health promotion services, um, and to have a focus on improving health as opposed to um, preventing exacerbation. Um, Again, it's just, and part of this is we don't know, we don't have clear oversight um, in many jurisdictions in Canada regarding what's happening in terms of healthcare. And then rule 33, the physician shall report to the prison director whenever he or she considers that a prisoner's physical or mental health has been or will be injuriously affected by continued imprisonment or by any condition of imprisonment. In my experience, um, most of the, the patients that I see um, experience adverse um, health impacts of incarceration. So, I mean, this would mean almost routinely reporting this to um, the prison director and, and that's, that's not uh, consistently, that's not the practice that's done. So um, the second um, standard that we could think about is legislation. So I've just pulled federal legislation here, which is the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. So again, this is for people in federal um, correctional facilities and section 86.1. Again, I don't have expertise and I have um, uh, been challenged previously with interpretation of legislation, but, but I think it's important to, at least at a high level, consider what the legislation says. The Correctional Service of Canada shall provide every inmate with essential health care. I don't find that a particularly accessible term and with reasonable access to non-essential mental health care that will contribute to the inmates rehabilitation and successful reintegration into the community. So again, um, there's sort of two separate standards set. One is for um, mental health care versus the rest of health care, which isn't typically the way we approach health within um, healthcare in, in the community in general, um, and also specifically um, the focus on rehabilitation um, and successful reintegration into the community, um, which I think is a, a problematic framing. And then the third and fourth um, standards that we could look at, um, community equivalence is language that's used um, quite frequently in United Nations documents, as well as um, some uh, work within Canada. Um, so equivalence um, typically is used to mean um, the same. So we should be able to at least meet the same standards that are available in the community. Obviously this can be problematic because of the scale. So prisons um, typically have a relatively small population compared to the general community. So how do we manage to provide at least the same standard of care? And then equity, so uh, as opposed to equivalence, which usually means the same, equitable would mean um, fair um, and in a way that will address any unfair um, health issues in this population. So as an example, one might say that um, equitable health care within prisons should have um, outstanding um, mental health care and substance use treatment um, in a way that is arguably superior to what's available in the community um, in order to be equitable. And um, again, I, I don't think we see that consistently across jurisdictions in Canada. So I'm gonna summarize the key messages. Um, first, imprisonment is common in Canada. I, I, I think um, given what most of you wrote in the poll, you'll, um, you'll agree that this, is, um, this experience is more common than um, many of us, even those of us who have enough of an interest to participate in this um, session 
um, would think. The second is that health status is worse for people who experience imprisonment compared to the general population. Third is that healthcare access and quality are worse. And again, this is overall uh, for people who experience imprisonment compared with the general population. And then fourth, that there are many opportunities to improve health for people who experience imprisonment. And I think that last point is the point that's most important, um, which is that um, there are things that we can do um, across the areas, upstream um, opportunities, downstream opportunities, including those three areas that I described. How do we prevent incarceration, or prevent imprisonment? How do we improve healthcare in our prisons? And how do we support people as they transition back to the community? So I will stop there and happy to hear any questions or comments you might have. Um, maybe I'll just leave it on the slide. Martha, should I hand it back to you? Sure. All right. Um, okay. So the first question that we have prison populations during the pandemic for various reasons. Uh, for example, reducing risk of transmission among um, people who are incarcerated and staff, relieving pressure from institutions. Given the barriers to healthcare access experienced by justice involved individuals that you've identified, how would you advise governments looking to increase and accelerate releases? How can we ensure continuity of care for justice involved individuals during COVID-19 when community resources are already overwhelmed? And all right, what's, what's your response to that, Fiona? Okay, I'm just catching up. I had to figure out how to stop sharing. And okay, so you're talking about the comment from Emad, is that right? Yes. Okay, sorry, Martha, I'm just gonna reread it myself. So calls within the prison populations. Um, I do think this is interesting. We have a uh, front page of the Herald today, our, our Nova Scotia newspaper talks about conditions in the prisons um, right now here due to how COVID has caused extra um, constraints on well-being. Yeah, I mean, I can I can say a few things um, on this topic. Um, so the the extent to which um, decarceration has been achieved during the coronavirus pandemic has varied substantially internationally and also across jurisdictions in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as someone who has followed this conversation um, nationally for many years, where I think there has been, to a large extent, um, reluctance to agree that decarceration is possible. And then in some jurisdictions, we've seen 30% of people released um, and efforts to keep people from being admitted to correctional facilities in the first place. I think this is important as an example of how when there is um, uh, clear uh, interest in um, achieving decarceration, we can do this. And um, Imad, based on your comment, it sounds like um, you're suggesting how do we do this um, increasingly? Um, and then how do we support people as they're released? I mean, this is a huge issue. Um, to give a concrete example, housing. I mean, we can see our um, shelter system, which obviously isn't the ideal form of housing that we want to transition people to, but our shelter systems, which are overwhelmed in the context of coronavirus. And then if we have 30% of people in provincial correctional facilities being decarcerated within the period of several months, um, shelters aren't able to absorb that kind of increased um, population size. Um, I think that the best thing we can do um, during COVID-19, but also routinely, is to create strong relationships between our correctional facilities and community organizations to support people um, in, in meeting especially their urgent needs. Um, at the time of release. And, and that's both, I think, because um, we have an obligation to do so. And also it sets people up for success. Um, 
Martha, I know that you've been, you know, actively involved in this area. So I don't know if you want to add anything. We did have a, a very successful program back in April. Um, compared to across across the country, there was a 26% decarceration rate uh, in provincial institutions. And here in Nova Scotia, we achieved 41. Um, that said, it's all gone. So the the, um, that worked because there was funding set aside for uh, Elizabeth Fry, Coverdale, and John Howard to support people who were coming out to house them, as you said, and to provide, um, well, not to provide the health care, but to make sure they got the health care um, that they needed. And that funding dried up at the end of the summer. And so then we saw our um, provincial institutions fill back up. So it, it does have to be a sustained um, arm of funding but it certainly didn't cause any harm to, to reduce the prison population by 41%. Yeah. Thanks for adding to that. Now the next question, um, I'm, I'm abiding by the, the voting. So if you want something, vote for it, people. Uh, the next question, this is a fascinating statistic. I think this was early on that this was posted, so it was probably about just how common incarceration is. Do you think this is a reflection of social structures leading to poverty and multiple contacts with the criminal system? Or two, the overcriminalization of stuff, addiction, men medical health issues, reproductive health, et, et cetera. What other factors may be contributing to this? Do these numbers make paramount reconceptualizing correctional facilities as key centers for healthcare delivery? Ooh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a really important question or series of questions, right? I think that it does reflect our social structures for sure, um, and, and as well as our like legal and policy context around um, how do people interact with the criminal justice system, all the way from police contacts through to who is incarcerated and for what. Um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the order shifted. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, our incarceration rate certainly reflects many issues. I mean, the, and the, um, conceptualizing correctional facilities as a, um, a key center for healthcare delivery. So a lot of people talk about this now in the context of deinstitutionalizations from psychiatric facilities, which happened decades ago, have our um, correctional facilities become the de facto place where people with severe mental illness access treatment, um, which I think is something that um, most Canadians would not be comfortable with. But when we look at the overrepresentation of people with severe mental illness, and that's just one example, substance use disorders um, is another in correctional facilities. Um, I, I think we see that happening. Um, so hang on, it's, um, oh, it's gone. They're gone. Oh, you clicked it to answered. Okay, so what other factors? Yeah, I mean, I would say broadly, we have like, what's the baseline health status of the population, which of course does reflect um, uh, policy and the healthcare system. And then uh, we have our um, legal and policy context with respect to the criminal justice system and how those interact, I think is what's what contributes to that. Um, but yeah, this is a whole area that, that needs a lot of work for sure. I think you're on mute, Martha. So the next question is from Dr. Wendy Norman. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm interested to hear your advice for the potential to improve strategies at the time of discharge to improve these transitions and perhaps establish or support continuity. It's yeah, I'm, I, I think um, for any problem. Yeah, some of this work um, needs to be done within correctional facilities. So how do we make sure that everyone who is admitted to a correctional facility, I mean, similar to the way we do when people are admitted to hospital, how do we start to plan for people's reintegration to the community? How do we routinely identify and address the needs that people will have at the time of release and plan for those? So is that housing? Is it access to primary care? Um, and, and put those things in place. And there are many 
challenges to this, including that um, uh, I think it's two thirds of people in our provincial correctional facilities are on remand, um, which means that they haven't yet been um, tried or sentenced. So we don't know um, to a large extent when people are gonna be released. So it is challenging to plan for this, but um, nonetheless, we have to try to do that and, and make it possible to have access to services in the community um, that can respond to needs um, on short notice. So I guess both focusing on what we do within our correctional facilities and then what how the community develops its services to be able to attend to this population. Um, and that can be all kinds of things. Do we have um, access to childcare while people are accessing healthcare or social services? Um, do we have access to um, getting a health insurance card for people who lose their ID. Um, how do we um, mm -hmm. make primary care accessible and acceptable? Um, and I think there are specific examples of where this has worked um, that we need to learn from, tailor, scale up um, across jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, that's that's this is the work we need to do. Yeah, we do have a, a program here locally where people are met when they're released. There's arrangements for a peer to meet them um, so that they have a, a companion, they have a bus ticket. Um, the, the basics that they might need as soon as they were, are released. It's, it's a very bare bones thing, but it's um, enormously supportive. I can just want to comment on that. Thanks, Martha. Is, um, you know, I think there have has been a lot of focus, um, at least internationally, possibly less so in Canada, on sort of disease specific. So, okay, you're a person with HIV in a correctional facility. How do we support you attending to your um, uh, need for care for HIV? And I think just one other sort of plug for primary care is, of course, people are not just a single disease or risk factor or issue. So I think we really need to think about how do we provide comprehensive care? You know, if people have to go see their probation parole officer twice a week, how do we make it easy for them to also access primary care to address the their health care needs? Like, how do we think about creative solutions that are um, person or patient focused, depending on sort of the lens we're coming at um, this with? So, um, Very much agree. Uh, Jocelyn, can you speak to the status of COVID vaccine delivery in prisons, how it's happening, what lessons we can learn from the decision making about it so far and from the politicization of the issue? And this has been a, a very differently approached between um, the, the pilot that the feds have, have launched this week uh, versus what Doug Ford said in Ontario and, and, and um, so on. So. We've, we've heard as of today that there's no plan yet for prisoners here in Nova Scotia. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to this in detail just because I don't know the details of it. Like I read the announcement, I guess it was early last week, although I might have that a bit wrong that um, um, around the um, prioritization of people in federal correctional facilities. Um, of course, people who are in congregate settings are at increased risk of acquiring transmission and acquisition of um, a respiratory illness such as coronavirus. Um, and, um, and then in federal facilities in particular where the um, age distribution is such that people are older and there is increased um, morbidity, then that puts people at increased risk of adverse consequences when they do get infected. So, you know, I think arguably it, it makes sense to consider different populations of people in correctional facilities differently. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't heard announcements from any provinces around similar decisions around people in provincial and territorial correctional facilities. Um, what lessons can we learn from the decision making so far? I mean, there isn't, I don't know how much transparency there's been um, consistently, but, but certainly when we think about principles around access to healthcare, whether it's about vaccination or other aspects of healthcare, um, you know, the, um, 
the fact is that incarceration or imprisonment is the punishment. It's not that you're supposed to have worse access to healthcare as far as you're supposed to have. Um, well, I went back previously through what, what are people supposed to have in, in correctional facilities, but certainly um, access to um, health care and vaccination would be included in part of that um, should be part of people's rights while they're in prison. Thank you. So Cora McKenna from the coast, what do you see as the media's role in this area? What does the media often get wrong about this kind of data storytelling, et cetera? Um, I don't know that I'm necessarily the best person to speak to this, but I can say a few thoughts, um, initial thoughts. Um, I mean, the media um, play an important role in trying to um, share information about what is often a very closed and inaccessible setting. And we have seen um, the media um, take initiative um, in um, sharing information and stories. Um, you know, at a high level, I think uh, federal correctional facilities have more um, or there's there's more uh, information that's readily accessible from federal correctional facilities through things like the Office of the Correctional Investigator. Mm -hmm. And um, we often see the media um, publicizing information that's shared through the Office of the Correctional Investigator or Correctional Service of Canada. And then with respect to um, more broadly, I think that the media will become involved when um, there is a story that is brought to light. Um, I don't, I, that maybe Martha, do you want to add to that? Um, <laughs> I, I think that one of the things that I, I would really like to see the media do is to change the language and um, less use of these um, stigmatizing terms like um, inmate, offender, um, that to try to change the conversation. And uh, one of the challenges that the media experience, I, I, I do empathize, is it's so difficult to talk to people inside. It's so, so difficult to get that side of the story. And um, so to, to continue to push for access to those voices, to that, to that truth of the, of the real experience, um, and not and, and not always just be repeating, for instance, what Doug Ford said. Um, but anyway, I, I, I deeply rely on the media for uh, exposing what's happening. The next question, I'm just gonna skip to somebody who hasn't um, been able to speak yet. Michelle asks, what is your opinion of decriminalization of all drugs? Love it. Um. I, I am, um, I guess I don't have like a quick answer to that. Um, I um, am um, interested in um, uh, strategies that will reduce the um, adverse impacts of substance use on the health of people who use substances. And I don't think that incarceration is working. So I guess at a very basic level, I think decriminalization um, makes sense. Um, the question was decriminalization of all substances. Um, maybe haven't thought that through, but have thought a bit more about opioids in particular. And um, you know, the really concerning consequences that I've seen in individual patients as well as uh, uh, in the research that I've done around um, dying from overdose in correctional facilities and um, and other harms that result from incarceration um, due to substance use. Um, yeah. We have had several deaths here in Nova Scotia for, um, and it's usually people who are very newly incarcerated and yeah, and then in the post-release period, of course, also. So it's um. Oh yes, very. Issue. 
elevation of risk at that point. Um, uh, thank you so much for this insightful presentation. Can you touch on the importance of decolonizing healthcare, education, med school, nursing school, et cetera, and how its Eurocentric nature perpetuates harm on vulnerable populations? Big question. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the work that we need to do, right? Like we need to take, like, take major steps to um, like address the issues that we have in healthcare. And of course that's true in correctional facilities where we see healthcare and correctional facilities where we see the overrepresentation of um, uh, people who are indigenous. Um, but it's also true about how we um, need to change healthcare in the community in order for people to be able to access acceptable high quality care. And, you know, one of the strategies that we need to um, uh, use to address that is through changing uh, healthcare education. Um, yeah, so if we have a problematic system and we keep doing the same thing, it's not gonna, it's not gonna change, right? So um, I, that's not super specific, but, um, but certainly I, I like support um, uh, efforts to uh, move toward decolonization um, in, in healthcare and in education in particular, Martha? Have you seen effective programs introduced at McMaster? within the med school? So I am, I am, um, I'm involved in specific initiatives in the medical school, but I don't know what the ongoing work is. I have been very impressed with the um, like level of engagement of um, trainees um, around um, initiatives, both anti-racism work and um, uh, um, decolonization work, but I, I can't speak to specific initiatives. I better, I better move us along here. Um, uh, Janine asked, do these stats include youth? Really good questions. So just about uh, the numbers earlier. Um, no, almost everything I've presented is only for adults. And in the international um, work around the health of people who experience um, imprisonment, there has been, it has been identified that we don't know that much about youth. Um, I also know that the rates of imprisonment are much lower for youth um, as a consequence of criminal justice system reform. Apologies, I don't know the details of this, but maybe um, 15 years ago. Um, so, um, and, and my um, admittedly limited experience of um, uh, visiting uh, youth justice facilities is that um, compared with my experience with adult correctional facilities is that even when people do um, experience imprisonment, um, it, it can be much more of a focus on rehabilitation. Um, and I'm not trying to at all glorify the um, correctional facilities for youth, but more, um, I think that there is a, an evidence informed um, approach which has led to decreasing incarceration rates as well as um, more of a focus on rehabilitation, which is um, a good direction to see things moving in. Yeah, absolutely. Here in Nova Scotia, we have vastly more restorative justice available to youth. Um, next question is uh, amazing presentation, so insightful. This is actually more of a comment. As someone who works in a federally funded halfway house, I believe it is so important to have these conversations and conduct this research so we can better serve the vulnerable populations that overrepresent our criminal justice system. So thank you, Caitlin. Uh, from Dell, health related information available to the courts at time of of sentencing and pre-sentence reports. I find that these sources tend to be very incomplete and I'm concerned that my bail sentencing decisions are inadequate as a result. Are there better ways of getting course access, courts access to health information for persons before the court? Excellent. So it's almost like, are there health-related GLADU reports or 
um, cultural assessments like we, we um, see in pre-sentencing. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll say a few things. Um, so I don't know um, the details of what this looks like. Certainly, um, if a person consents to sharing their health records, um, those can be shared with um, uh, their representation and can um, be used to um, inform discussions around the case. Um, so, I mean, it might be a question of um, like, should there be a routine um, assessment of whether that's appropriate? Um, because certainly, you know, the person owns their chart, right? So they should always have access to that information. Now, that's not um, the same thing necessarily as having an assessment done, because if someone isn't accessing healthcare, you know, for example, if someone doesn't have a comprehensive assessment of their health status, it doesn't really matter if you have access to their chart because it might not have the information that is needed to be able to um, bring the relevant information to the court proceedings. Um, but, but that would be an initial thought with the consent from the um, person mm -hmm. to have access to um, their, their chart information. And then of course, to um, request, we often in the correction facility where I work, we often get requests from lawyers um, you know, flagging an issue, this person isn't getting the care they need, or please prescribe this medication, which of course is not an appropriate request, but nonetheless, it's something we can consider. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that would be an initial, an initial thought. That's great. I'm going to have to end our question period now. We're at uh, 120. Um, thank you so much for a fabulous discussion, Dr. Kiyumjin. And I want to thank everybody for participating. We had 100 people on this call, so it was uh, really wonderful. And almost everybody was able to stay the whole time. Um, next, no, not next week, in two weeks, we will have uh, Sharon Davis Murdoch as our speaker for the Health Law Seminar. And she will be speaking on the matters of Black health, resilience, and determination. I hope you can all join us then. Again, same same idea, Zoom with closed captioning. So um, with that, that's all I have. And I um, encourage everybody to um, look up Dr. Kiyumjin's work and um, continue to be interested in, in, in this, um, this area. Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye.